Let's give our diligent attention then to God's holy word. It's entitled to the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we confess again, without you we can do nothing. And so have mercy now that your word may go forth in spirit and in power and with conviction, that we may know more of Christ's kingdom, of its joys, its delights, and also our duties. Give us your spirit, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I think when we consider the life of the church at large, and particularly the mission of the church, we're going to see two great polarized errors in the history of Christianity. Perhaps we see it uh, certainly from the revivals of the 18th century, well into today's time, where we see that man-centered approach to the mission of the church. It's about getting people through the doors and doing anything to get them through the doors. It's, it's a numbers game. It's man-centered in means, in method, and in goals. The other extreme is, of course, what we find in reformed circles, what's perhaps known as hyper-Calvinism. That God will work regardless of what the church does. That God's going to bring in his people regardless of what we as individuals or the church does. Of course, both extremes are wrong. Uh, they're false. They're false in theology. One puts all the emphasis upon the activity of man. One, the other, denies the activity of man. One puts all the emphasis upon God and one denies that God is needed in the process. Of course, both are true. God is at work, and so must the church be at work. And this psalm provides us with that careful balance. The absolute necessity for God to bless the kingdom enterprise of the church, but we also see the church acting, working, doing things. This psalm is the death knell to those two theological errors one which is man-centered, and one which is fatalistic. In order for God to bless the nations, you see, which he will do, he will do it, that's a certainty, but he has chosen to use instruments or means, the chief of which is what? It's the church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so kingdom growth depends on the blessing and the work of Almighty God as he works in and through the church. There's a careful balance to be found here. This psalm has almost a prophetic quality. It's looking forward into the future, as indeed so many of the psalms do. And it's anticipating its great goal. That is a goal where the entire world sees and knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the prayer is something, the psalm rather, is something of a prayer. It's asking God to do something within the church in order that the nations round about may indeed be blessed. And that's what you see in the first two verses. You see a prayer with a purpose in verses one and two, a prayer with a purpose. Then in verses three to five, it's almost as if implicitly within the text, the prayer has been answered. And then in verses 6 and 7, the psalmist is reflecting on answered prayer. He's looking back on the fact that the psalm, the prayer, has been answered. And so this is a prayerful psalm, as many of them are. Let's look at that prayer then, with a purpose, the first two verses. 
The language of the first two verses should be familiar to most of us here today. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. We know where that comes from, of course. But consider before we look at those words, I want you to consider the context of the psalm. Now this is something that we've been really bad at doing in the church, looking at the psalms in context. Because there is a general context and there is a narrow context. What is the general context? Well, it's the Davidic covenant. The covenant that God made with King David, that one of his line would sit on his throne forever. We're in the era of the kings. Israel is the peculiar covenant nation of God, chosen by God as the covenant people. And yet this psalm has a peculiar view to the Gentiles, does it not? Verse 2, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. It has an eye, you see, not just to Israel and God's blessing on Israel, but all of the world. And so we have a brief window into Old Testament theology here, just by the opening of the psalm. Israel, and I say this much less the church, but Israel should never have been characterized by the self-centered and the self-satisfied mindset that we see in the early books of the New Testament. This psalm has an expansive view, an expansive view of kingdom life, not just Israel. The entire world is in view here. That's the general context. The narrow context is the book of Psalms itself. This psalm is found in book two of the Psalms, Psalm 41, I think, to 72. What is that book about? It's about the glories of the Davidic kingship. The Psalms are characterized in this book about how great Israel was under God. There's only been one nation under God and it was Israel. And it was a blessed time and book two of the Psalms speaks to that. That God was their God and he was going to bless them. But it also contains a theme of communication. Book two of the Psalms speaks to the nations round about Israel. And it says to them, come and worship the Lord. Come and worship God. Join yourself to Israel. Consider Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing glory to his name. It's a call for the nations to come in and worship God with Israel. Why? Verse 5. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of man. Verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. It's a call to the nations to consider the blessedness of one nation under God and to come and join themselves to Israel. Just as Rahab had done. Just as Uriah the Hittite had done. Just as Rahab had done. But we have to ask ourselves, was Israel a success in being this light to the Gentiles? Could they have been a success? Were they a success? Well, the answer's got to be no. As an evangelistic and missional enterprise, ancient Israel was a disaster. Why? This is key to the psalm. Because they began to look like the nations, rather than the nations looking like them. Come and see what God has done. Come over to us. Join us. Become one of us. Just as Ruth said to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. But Israel said to the nations, no, actually your gods are going to be our gods. Therein lies the failure of ancient Israel. Therein lies the failure of much of the church in the new covenant. The church has begun to look too much like the world. It's a sobering reminder to us, brethren. The church, if it is to take any part in this missional enterprise of God, is to be the church, not the world. And that's why the prayer is so important. Verse 1, the prayer is Israel, corporately us. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face to shine upon us. It's the prayer of the lesser Israel to the greater God. That God might act according to his revealed will. Notice that. 
It's a prayer that God would act according to his revealed will, that God would bless them with his favor, that he would pour out the rains, refreshing rains from heaven, that they might once again be what? Not increased in number necessarily, or their borders might grow, no. That they might become true Israel. That they might be Israel of God. Worshipping him properly. Blessing him properly. Serving him properly. That they might once again experience with refreshness. Being refreshed rather by God's graciousness and his blessing. We have there the idea of his countenance also. Again we see it in Numbers chapter 6 do we not? And make your face to shine Upon us, how does God look upon his people? He beams down on them as the sun beams down on the earth. His face shines upon his people. You know what light is a symbol of in the Old Testament? It's a symbol of God's presence. And you know what light is a symbol of in the New Testament? It's a symbol of life. And so what do we have here? We have the Lord God shining down upon his people. He is with them, with his presence, and his presence does what brings life to them. They're praying God be amongst us, that we might turn from our sins, that we might be your people in order that the nations might know you. The language is, of course, straight out of Numbers chapter 6, the Aaronic blessing. We looked at some of that last week a little bit. But remember what's said in Numbers 6, 27, after there is that blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. God says, so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. That is what Israel is praying for. That God in his name, in his person, in his presence would be there right in their midst and they would know the blessing of God. We would learn well from this prayer, brethren. We as the New Covenant Church. That scripture, this scripture, gives us the right. Indeed, it calls us to pray to God on the basis of his character and activity. Notice this, brethren. This is the only time in your whole of your prayer lives that you can be absolutely certain you're praying according to the will of God is when you pray God's revealed will back to him. What did the Lord say he would do in Numbers? He said, I will bless you and keep you and make my face to shine upon you. Now the psalmist says the people of God are praying those very things. Oh, what great confidence there is, brethren, when we come to the throne of grace and we take God's character, we take his activity, we take his promises and say, Lord, you have said you will do this. Please now do it in my life. Do it in the life of this church. That's what Israel is doing. If I can say this, this is Israel at its best. On its knees in prayer, reflecting on who almighty God is and saying, Lord God, work among us. And how does that blessing manifest itself in the life of Israel and in the life of church? Is it by numbers? Is it by increasing their borders? Well, God did that. But no, actually, it's in greater fidelity to him. It's in greater fidelity to the truth. It's in his people worshipping him properly. Not like we read back in Numbers 16 a few moments ago. It's in greater conformity. For you, brethren, to the Lord Jesus Christ and for us as a church to the biblical pattern of what the church is. And the prayer is prayed for a purpose. It's a gloriously selfless purpose. How much of our prayers are taken up with, Lord, do this for me? There's a time and place for that, make no mistake. But this is a gloriously selfless purpose. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. They're praying, Lord, bless your church that we might be the church and the nations round about will come flocking to you, Lord God, and worship you having come to know you in and through your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, it's an expansive vision of the church. It's a global vision. It's a blessed vision, brethren. And it's a prayer that every sinner who has been saved by grace 
ought to be praying. Why? Because we know we've been saved by grace. Do we not want the same for others? Where did the Reformed Church go wrong when we became a little bit like ancient Israel? Or you can join us just so long as you look like us, you dress like us, you've got the same theology as us. You can join us on our terms. And you can come to us because we're not going to come to you. I've seen it too many times. That we sit back like those hyper-Calvinists do. And say, well, if God wants the nations to come in, he'll bring them in. What a denial of the means that God has ordained. A denial of the instrument, the instrumentality of the church of Jesus Christ. What is the church's job? Go into all the world. The new covenant church is an extroverted church. It goes out. It's expansive. It's global. How are they going to find that way, the way of God? It's by his saving power being made known among all the nations. There's no sense here, brethren, in ancient Israel of the kind of spiritual snobbery that produced we have Abraham as our father. Or the kind of spiritual snobbery that produced can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh no, this is the church of its best. Praying that God would bless us. Ancient Israel, that the nations might see the glory of God. What it's like to be blessed by God Almighty. In a world which doesn't know God and denies God. Here's a group of people the world can say where God is. Jesus is among them. I want a part of that. Let your light so shine, said our Lord. Matthew 5, 14, I think. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what's going on here. They're praying, Lord, bless us. Oh, that we look like the church, that we'll be the church we ought to be, and then the nations will see it. And consider there the dynamics of this prayer. Notice first, before God acts in this psalm, there is a prayer. There is a prayer. Who offers the prayer? It's not God. God doesn't need to pray. He has no need to pray for himself. Who prays? It's the people of God. They are acting. They are doing. Not without reference to God's causing power, of course, but they're doing something. They're calling upon God to bless in order that they might be a witness to the nations. You see, there is an instrumentality, an instrumentality in the church of Jesus Christ. At the very least, brethren, we must be a praying church. A praying church. Consider this. We must be a praying church that God would bless us and be gracious to us and make his face to shine upon us that we might be the church of the Bible. That we should be what we should be. And that has an impact not just upon us in this room now but particularly when you leave those doors and you go into your homes when you're with your wife or your husband or your children when you go into your workplace, when you're with your colleagues, that you might be the husband, wife, father, mother, child, employee, employer, that you ought to be so that men might see your good works, so that the way of God might be known on the earth, his saving power among all nations. You see, when the church is the church, as it should be in scripture, that's when it works well. We can't be like the world. And brethren, if each one of us were able to honestly examine ourselves, we would see just how much of the world has crept into us and thus has crept in to the church. Brethren, is the salvation of souls important enough to each one of you here today? And to me, is it important enough that we will not only pray this prayer, but act according to the prayer? 
Perhaps one of the reasons Reformed churches, in my experience at least, have seen so few conversions is that perhaps we're a bit unchristlike. Not just in this room, but in our various callings. Perhaps one of the reasons why we've seen so few conversions is that we look just too much like the world. Like ancient Israel, the traffic was in the wrong direction. They became like the world rather than the world becoming like them, the covenant people of God. But the psalm continues in verses 3 to 5 with the psalmist anticipating the blessing that has been prayed for in verses 1 and 2. There is an anticipation, a realization, I think, behind these words. The prayer of the psalmist is answered. A worldwide blessing, the nations coming to inherit covenant life. Notice what it says there. The structure is very clear. Verse 3 and verse 5 are replicated. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And then right in the middle of that sandwich, verse 4, are the reasons why the people are praising God. It's because Christ, the king, will judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Now we need to be very clear, these are all commands. Let the peoples praise you, O God. It's a particular kind of command in the Hebrew, and it doesn't translate to an exact command as in, you must do this. But that form there of verse 3, twice, verse 4, and again twice in verse 5, they're effectively commands. Is the psalmist simply saying, these pagans, they ought to be praising God, so do it. Is that what he's saying? I don't think so. I mean, that's true. They ought to be praising God. Everyone ought to be praising God. But this is not a mere empty command, hoping that the nations will come to faith. No, it's an anticipation, in a sense, or an answer that the blessings of verse 1 and 2 have been provided by God, and that ancient Israel has acted as the church of their day and been a light to the nations. And so what do we have? We have an answer, in a sense, to the prayer of verses 1 and 2. The nations have indeed come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 tells us that. They're going to sing for joy. Uh, Verse 6 tells us that. The, The earth has yielded its increase. Increase of what? Of souls. The psalm tells us, you see. It has that prophetic vision. It looks forward. Here's the prayer, the petition. Then there's the answer. Then verse 6 and 7 reflecting back on the whole process. What has happened? God has blessed us. Verse 6 and 7. God shall bless us. Yes, indeed, he shall. What's the psalm looking forward to there in verses 3 to 5? Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the peoples praise you, O God. It's looking forward to the age of the new covenant. It's the age in which we now live, brethren. It has that prophetic voice that so many of the Psalms have, saying what will come to pass in the unfolding history of redemption. It's the new covenant age, inaugurated in the first coming of Christ, then the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost, and it will be closed by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do we see now in this age? We see the gospel going to the four corners of the earth. We began to see that, though, in the book of Acts. Listen to what we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 7 following. The day of Pentecost, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Listen, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. You see, Acts chapter 2 is a fulfillment in part of Psalm 67. The nations hearing the gospel. And that's exactly what they say. That's what they say in Acts chapter 2. What are they hearing? They are hearing, he says, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Precisely, the church being the church. 
And Acts closes on that same note, Acts 28, 28. Paul says, therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God, it's almost the same language of 67 verse 2, this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. It is of this church, brethren, that we belong. Salvation has come to the Gentiles and salvation has come to you. We are then, brethren, a living representation, a living fulfillment of Psalm 67. Think about it. The very fact you are here today is proof that God has been faithful in Psalm 67, that he has begun to answer this prayer. Yes, Jesus Christ has come. What did he do? He came to judge, as we read there in verse 3, to judge the peoples with equity. Did he not judge the man born blind with equity? Did he not come to guide the nations? Did he not heal Jairus' daughter? He's come to guide the nations. To do what he was doing in the garden with Adam and Eve. And that we lost in the fall. And he reinstated it when he came in time and now gave us his spirit. And it will be consummated when? In the new heavens and new earth. Because ultimately that's where this psalm leads us. To the glorious reality. The glorious reality that all the peoples in the new heavens and the new earth will praise God. You might have thought I'm a post-millennial by the way I'm preaching. I'm not. It might disappoint some of you, I don't know, but I'm not, but, but that's what the psalm says. There is an age to come, and there is a growing time in this age, before the second coming of Christ, where the gospel will be spread aboard, and then everyone, everyone will worship the Lamb and Almighty God on the new earth. No one that causes an offense, the book of Revelation. No one left in their sin will be given entry to the new Jerusalem, the church. They will be put outside. Now this anticipates, of course, the glories of the new heavens and the new earth. How did this happen? Well, with tragedy. How did the message go from the Jews to the Gentiles? Well, consider the kings. The language of this psalm is filled with royal kingship language. There's judgment, there's guidance, there's equity, and so on. It's kingship language. The psalm is written during the time of the Davidic kings. Important lesson, as it is with the king of Israel, so it is with the people. Remember that as you read the Old Covenant. As it is with the king, so it goes with the people. And what were the kings of Israel like? Wretches. Wretches. And what was Israel like? As it is with the king. When Paul said that statement in Acts 28, 28, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, he finishes that sentence by saying, they will listen. Why? Because the Jews rejected. Listen. The Jews departed, Paul, after Paul had made one statement, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people, the Jews, and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. It's because the Jews rejected that the Gentiles were included. And brethren, that's a great warning for the church of Jesus Christ today. A great warning for the church of Jesus Christ. Remember what is said in Matthew chapter 3 by John the Baptist to the Jews, the covenant people of the day, just as we are the covenant people of this day. He says this then, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now, listen to this, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Oh, brethren, let us take great care 
that individually and corporately we never become like ancient Israel, self-satisfied, self-content, happy that our numbers are growing and never going to the nations, never sharing our faith with our colleagues or our neighbours or our unbelieving family members. Brethren, if we're careless and prayerless about the kingdom, we ought to ask ourselves, are we in it? Do we belong to this kingdom? If on the surface we look like the church, and yet underneath we look like the world, there's a strong probability we do not belong to the kingdom of Christ. And individually or corporately, notice that, individually or corporately, an axe will be laid to our root. And we will be cast into the fire we cannot pray for God's blessing upon his kingdom if we are ignoring that we, the church, are the primary means through which he has ordained. He will bless the world with salvation. We can't pray for anything that God calls us to pray for and ignore our own personal duty. That's the reality. We have a duty. It's a joyous duty, but it's a duty nonetheless. To call not only upon the name of the Lord, but then also to act in accordance with them. Brethren, what a tragedy when the church ceases to be the church. History will show this time and time again. Look at the PCUSA today. Hemorrhaging members by the million. Why? Because they look like the world. And don't think the OPC is exempt from that sin. Oh, what folly that would be to think that we are better than that. If we don't praise God, surely the very stones will cry out in praise of God. Because we know the answer to this prayer is revealed in verses 3 to 5 and confirmed or reflected upon in verses 6 and 7. It's not the case if the church fails, there'll be no one to praise God. God's going to do the job with or without us. And if it's without us, he'll set us aside and raise up others to be the church. That's what I mean by the axe is laid to the root. There will be others if we don't do it. And the psalmist shows us that certainty in verses 6 and 7, and very briefly, as he reflects on the whole dynamic of this psalm. What's he prayed for? God's blessing on the church to be the church, to be the light, so that the nations might be saved. And what's the answer there in verse 6? The earth has yielded its increase. How some commentators get agriculture and the harvest out of this verse is beyond me. It's got nothing to do with corn. It's got everything to do with a harvest of souls. John chapter 4 verse 34. Listen. Our Lord Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish that, this work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. It's a harvest of souls. That's our job, brethren. We can't convert anyone. We can't change anyone's heart. We can't even change our own hearts. But we're there as an instrument which God will use. We must declare the excellencies of Christ. Personally, we must. Corporately, we must. We must be engaged in an active prayer life and an active evangelism and leave the rest up to God. Praying and evangelism are the easy bits. The difficult bit is left to the Holy Spirit to regenerate the heart of man. Leave that to him. Psalm says the earth has yielded its increase. Yes, indeed. It's almost that the psalmist has gone way into the future and is looking back down at the corridor of time to see how the gospel spread from Palestine through the Middle East to Europe and beyond to the whole world. And yet, brethren, we have neighbors, we have family members, we have colleagues who are dying in unbelief. There's your mission field. There's your mission field. If God calls you to go halfway around the world, so be it. Praise the Lord. But he's called you to hear. Your neighborhoods, your families, 
your workplaces, clubs and associations that you belong to, you are to be the light to those round about you. Yes, what do we see in verse 6 and 7? A reflection on the blessing of God. Notice that the earth has yielded its increase. And in the last sentence there, let all the ends of the earth fear him. And then in the middle sandwich, once again, God our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. He has. He's blessed this church mightily. And never forget, to the one who much has been given, much will be required. Well, let's never forget that, brethren. Much is required of this church because much has been given to it. And you think, oh, I'm scared to do evangelism. Aren't we all? I'm scared to witness. That's fine. Do it. Do it. You're only responsible for the prayer bit and the evangelism bit. God can bless or not bless as he sees fit. You see, this is part of what it means to be a Christian. This is part of what it means to be the Christian church, is that the name of Jesus Christ goes forth from among our ranks. Do we need to pray? Do we need to speak or live in a more faithful manner? Let us commit ourselves to that. What shall we pray? For what shall we pray? Pray this, brethren. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let's pray. Indeed Lord God be gracious to us your people. And bless us your people. Make your face to shine upon us. So that we may live in a way that brings those who are being saved into your kingdom, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Give us faith and give us trust in you, almighty God. For you are our true God, and Jesus is our King. Grant unto us then, Lord, to be what we ought to be, that is the church of Jesus Christ. And bless our labours, we pray, in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.